Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to the uh, Game Center lecture series and uh, tonight's panel on games journalism, games writing. Um, I, uh, before I introduce our esteemed panel, um, I would like to, uh, to thank, uh, the, uh, thank you all for coming and um, also thank the uh, Rockefeller uh, cultural innovation grant that is helping to make this series po uh, possible as well as uh, other uh, generous donors to the Game Center. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, let's do a, a, a quick poll uh, checking on, on uh, communications techniques. How many people found out about this event via email? Via email, let's say, who found out about via email from the Game Center? So the Game Center sends out information. Raise your hands up if you found out about this event through email from the Game Center. So three, four, five people maybe. Uh, okay, so raise your hand if, you're, uh, if you've primarily found out about this event by reading about it on a blog. Raise your hand if that was the way you found out about it. So uh, keep your hand up if that blog was Kotaku. Did you? Okay, so actually, <laughs> the extra hands yes. went up. Yes. Uh, and okay, so put your hands down. Go talk to people. And um, raise your hand if you if you found out about this via Twitter, if that was your main method. So okay, interesting. And and raise your hand if it was uh, just via word of mouth, the conversation with someone else. So that's actually that's probably looks like maybe number two. So Kotaku is number one. Uh, like and first, first journalism point of the panel. That was plagiarism, was it not? Yeah, it was, that was Stephen Totilla's idea that I just <laughs> that I stole. <laughs> um, and uh, and this is the lesson: is you have to fight for credit for your ideas because other people <laughs> will steal them and take credit for them. Um, all right. So uh, so this evening we're going to be uh, talking with uh, Stephen Totillo and uh, Jam and Brophy Warren and Lee Alexander. Uh, uh, so just a kind of brief introduction uh, uh, for these uh, people. Jammin uh, is a writer covering arts and entertainment with a focus on video games and um, is the editor and I guess the, one of the founders of a new magazine called Kill Screen, um, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, so he spent four years at the Wall Street Journal as an arts and entertainment reporter and was previously a music critic for Pitchfork Media. And he writes columns for the Wall Street Journal and for Good Magazine and has written stuff in, in Paste and Fast Company and a bunch of other places. Uh, Steven Totillo is the deputy editor for video gaming blog Kotaku, uh, which many of you are fans of. And uh, prior to joining Kotaku, uh, Totillo was MTV News's first full-time video game reporter. Uh, his work appeared online and on air on MTV and MTV2 and MTVU and the international channels. Uh, and um, mtvnews.com, and the multiplayer blog, which he uh, founded. And he's also written about video games for the New York Times, Newsweek, Time, IGN, GameSpy, and some other places. Uh, Lee Alexander is the news director of industry trade site Gamasutra, and author of the Sexy Video Game Land blog, and uh, also author of a monthly column at Kotaku. Uh, in the past, she served as Kotaku's associate news editor, and prior to that, ran the Gamma Sutra sister site, Worlds in Motion, which covered uh, the business of online games and social networks and virtual worlds and stuff like that. Uh, her work has appeared in Variety, Wired, Slate, The Escapist, and The AV Club. So uh, first of all, please uh, join me in welcoming our, our panel. Thank you all for coming. Um, so um, I want to... Uh, just kick it off by asking uh, up front, what is your your favorite thing um, and maybe your least favorite thing about your job right now? So maybe starting with you, Jim, <laughs> and if you could just tell us what you love about what you do and what you don't love so much. I guess about. Th those are probably the same thing. Um, um, starting a magazine and starting a magazine uh, mm -hmm. are my two most uh, favorite and least favorite things. I mean. On the plus side, there's, uh, I'll start with the bad things first okay. and then move into the good things. Uh, just starting something new, starting a new project, there's all kinds of stuff that is not fun, setting up a business, oh, right. This is Jammin's uh, new magazine, yep. which is awesome. Uh, we just got awesome. it two, two weeks ago. Yep. Um, so, right, so, I mean, getting to this really sucks, but getting this is really awesome. Um, I mean, the, the not so fun part is just like, you know, 
dealing with uh, setting up a new business, getting people to collaborate with you, trying to do things on a shoestring budget, um, convincing people of your vision, trying to convince people that doing something in print is not totally insane. Um, and then obviously the best parts is when this shows up, when you know, you know, 15, 17 boxes of these things show up at your doorstep. Uh, and you get to send those out, which I've been doing for the last two weeks. <laughs> so sorry if anybody hasn't gotten theirs yet. Um, that feels really, really awesome. And I know that at some point, someday, this will be something that I can, I can show my kids. So I, I like both. Those are my two least. Okay. In the, nice. Yeah. Good. What about you, Stu? Um, I don't really have any complaints, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Except that damn Brian Crescent. <laughs> There's authority in your side. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, he's my boss. Yeah, um, but uh, no, it, I, I'm lucky enough to have a job that I love. That is something that uh, if one could, could, could live without money, and therefore I would accept being, uh, my job without being paid for it, because it's just something I really enjoy doing. Luckily, it intersects with something that I never get sick of, just playing games. Um, the biggest problem, it's not going to sound like a problem probably, is that it can become this all-consuming thing. Uh, if you do reporting well, I think you can't really ever turn the job off. So the job never has any hours that end, it never really has any vacation. You're constantly working, looking for a good story, writing that story, uh, constantly hustling. And that can be all-consuming, and it can threaten the other parts of your life from being as happy as uh, you know, what, you're, what you're doing for your trade. But um, in expressing the negative, I've also just expressed the positive. It's something that I never tired of, and I think that all three of us here are kind of intoxicated by uh, the idea of writing about and video games, talking to people who make them. It's just a, a great gig. Can you speak up a little bit? Thank you. Sure. <laughs> 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 and Guy Crowley. And Guy Crowley. <laughs> <laughs> um, Before you keep going, oh. can you put this on so it can record? Sure. The other one doesn't work. Wow. Wow. <laughs> doesn't wow. You're very important. Did anyone us. hear anything I said? Yeah. That was no, just but a, nobody cared. Just a lot of noise. <laughs> oh, shit. Did I? Do I have um, two mics on now? <laughs> what happened? Is that working now? Is it? I guess your other one just didn't work. Yeah. Mm. Um, all right, uh, Lee. What about you? Um, I think for me, one of my favorite things about um, being in the position that I'm in is the newness of the medium. Um, I get to write a lot about um, what I think games can and will be, um, as much as about um, you know where they are. It's it's really for me really exciting to. Um, contribute a critical voice to something that's growing and emerging so quickly. Um, you get to be on the front lines of something that's developing and you're, you're literally like writing history as it's happening. It's really, it, that's what's exciting for me is that it's an emerging medium and it's a high growth medium. Um, and also I'm, I'm really, really lucky in that um, you know, my full-time job is I'm a trade and a business writer, but um, I have a wonderful boss, Simon Carlos, who um, you know lets me sort of pursue some consumer-facing work if that's you know something I enjoy. That's why I get to write. Have had been edited by both of these gentlemen and be in Kill Screen and Kotaku. So um, that's, those kind of things are, are, uh, are privileges for me. Um, the downside, I guess, um, is I mean this is going to sound really awful, but the hardest thing about my job is sometimes gamers. Um, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't be doing this without, w if gamers were not so passionate and so like polarizing and such vocal, intense people, I wouldn't have a job, but then I also, you know, wouldn't like fly into a rage sometimes at like my stat referrers or my twi people tweet ridiculous things at me and, you know, gamers are very um, passionate, which is a double-edged sword, so I guess sometimes that's, that's difficult. Nice. Um, so let me ask you guys a, a general question, um, which is, what is the role of games journalism in your mind? Like, what is what's the what's the important role that that uh, fills, and and is it doing a good job at that role? I mean, you, you sometimes hear soul searching uh, among game writers about you know what it is that uh, they should be doing and whether or not they're doing a good job. And so I just want to hear you guys your opinions about uh, what you think that that role is and whether you think as a, as a as an industry it's doing a good job. Anybody? <laughs> I, well, I, I don't think it differs. <laughs> we'll just go in order. I'm sorry. Go no, no, no. no we'll get to Jump in. Um, I, I think that uh, it, it doesn't differ too much from, um, from what other journalists do. I think it's designed to keep the video game industry accountable, both in terms of the types of products and the quality of products that they're releasing, and also as critics. I think that's extremely important, keeping, uh, keeping developers on their toes in terms of evaluating games, not just for their graphical fidelity or do they deliver as promised, but how they how they, how they actually play, what they make you feel like. Um, I think both of those roles are really important. So I, I mean, I don't really segregate games journalism from kind of journalism writ large. 
Go ahead, Lee. Let's, let's mix the order up. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that the term games journalism, I mean, it's pretty, pretty broad because we have, um, you know, we have like things like reviews. We have news about what game companies are doing. We have like quick facts that a game is coming out being made by X Studio. Then we have things that are interviews with developers about process. Then we have things that are, you know, intended to sort of um, provoke different types of thought on games. So I mean, it's such a such a broad word when you say games journalism. Um, I definitely, I'm with Jamin when he talks about you know accountability in terms of you know, and Stephen will probably agree with me in terms of the the role of a reporter. Um, me, you know, I. I sort of see myself as an interpreter or an ambassador, I guess, um, because I write for both developers and consumers. Um, I like to think that I'm helping, um, you know, helping people, you know, have a home for their thoughts and discussions um, on the medium, you know, whether that's a business trend issue or a, a cultural trend or a narrative trend, that kind of thing. So, right. I, I mean, I agree with bo what both of them said, and uh, one of the things, though, the and, and can people hear me now, at least? <laughs> Good. Um, one of the things that I, I think becomes, that sort of enters into that question of what games journalism is, is um, should anybody be paid to do it? Because <laughs> with journalism, uh, more and more, <laughs> well, <laughs> you, sh you should. You should. <laughs> but with, with journalism you know, of, of any type, you know, we're seeing more and more people be able to report directly via Twitter. You know, how do we find out a lot about what was going on in Iran during the elections? It was through Twitter, right? That helped. We also had established media reporting. We have people reviewing games on their own, on their own sites or on message boards and whatnot. So what do you need to pay, have somebody be a paid reviewer of games for? So I, I found that the, 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 my best, um, the best things that I can provide as a professional that somebody who's not paid to do this pro probably can't do is to be even more present at more places, ask more questions and synthesize more thinking and ideas that are going on around gaming than any one person could from a blog that they have to maintain from one place or something. So the fact that I get to go, I think when I go to PAX East tomorrow, that'll be my fifth gaming convention traveling thing or whatever in the last seven weeks. And the fact that I can go from one room speaking to one game developer to another room speaking to another, to another room speaking to a gamer, and all those people's thoughts about games are things that I have access to and then can try to sort of collect those all out of my curiosity and then share them with people is something that you still can't replicate through Twitter through a message board or something like that, so that the, the professional games journalist and the professional journalist in general has a certain amount of access that um, is valuable that they can do great things with, hopefully. I, I want to agree with that point that you just made. Sorry, real quick. Um, it's that access to developers is fundamentally, I think, really important. You can't understate um, how relevant it is to talk to the people who make games about what they do and to have an understanding of development and product and process. Um, that sort of, you know, your, your, your average gamer may have great ideas about the medium and about how they feel about a work or something they're playing, but the training that it takes to understand development, to understand the business of games, and the ability to speak to and ask people about it, I think is another major differentiating factor that Stephen touched upon. So it's interesting. It occurs to me as I, as I uh, described the, the, the stuff that you guys do, um, it's really wide ranging, um, and and it and it combines both uh, investigative journalism and sort of you know finding stories and fact checking and that kind of uh, more traditional reporting uh, with with opinion and criticism and uh, and also uh, the kind of cultural uh, interpretation that you were describing, Lee, the, the feeling of an ambassador, you know, kind of. Uh, larger um, sort of conceptual pieces about the meaning of, of something uh, in culture. And do you guys all feel like that's, that, that's just a mix or is there one aspect of that that's the most important thing for you or is there a different focus between the three of you? Like, I'm just trying to, like, which of those things, is, is it all just blended together or is there, is there a core of it uh, and then the others are, are kind of on the margins for you guys? For Kotaku, it's definitely the mix of just about everything you said. Mm -hmm. um, there were times where Kotaku was branded as just being about video game cakes, or it was just about, <laughs> uh, it was, Cake Taku. We ate, our April Fool's joke last year was that we turned Kotaku into Cake Taku. Like screenshots uh, it was just and cakes. trailers. And, um, and, th and there are times when we, we definitely try to expand into doing a lot more, you know, sort of digging kind of reporting, real reporting, and I, I'm proud that that's part of what we do. But 
There was a time when I didn't want to review games because I felt like the reporter cannot also be the critic. That those are right, two. Right, that's what I was trying to get at. Is, is there potentially a and it's, problematic? And it's felt right? kind of weird to be doing both because it feels weird one day to be interviewing the lead designer, creative director of Red Steel 2, Wii game that came out this week. And I've interviewed him a couple of times. And so when I'm interviewing him, I'm trying to be as uh, you know, relatively dispassionate and just finding out what he thinks and what what he's up to and his agenda and what he thinks he's done with the game. It's kind of weird to then have to go review the game and start saying, okay, well, then this is what I think of it. And then it's even a little weirder to then go back to trying to be in reporter mode if I have to interview him again in the future. But it seems to me that that's what people are kind of, that's what people are demanding, that people who consume this type of stuff are interested in, well, what did you find out, but also what did you think? And it kind of does both of those things. Yeah, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, I mean, that's happened a lot. That's happened in magazine writing you know, since the new journalism movement, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. So there's definitely space for a blend of the two of those. I, you know, I think, I, I mean, for me, the most important thing is actually picking up the phone. Just my background as a reporter, I found that that is, rather than speculating on what might be happening, even if the response is no comment, I find that those things are just picking up the phone and calling somebody is, I, I think that that's a defining mark of kind of, professionals and kind of the amateurs and it um, sounds simple but so few people actually so few people yeah. I mean even if it's just like calling the company and calling the publicist and saying hey what's going on and they say well nothing and you're like well I heard this and they say well I don't know then you report on that process and then you know obviously you guys do that a lot more in real time online I mean I, I do think that the other thing is like that that split between criticism and 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 um, traditional journalism becomes I think it's less of a problem for the writer I think it's more a problem for the company is actually that they don't want to put you in the room if you have a long history of like slagging Sony games or something like that. So I mean, I think back to Lee's point, I mean, what's often very valuable for games journalists is having access. That often, I think the, the traditional reason why most newspapers set up that wall between traditional criticism and ed, you know, and between you know um, the reporting the, the reporting side is that the company you can always blame you know oh, if someone writes a bad review of a mu movie when the reporter comes back to report on that studio the, the newspaper can say like oh well that wasn't me that's just the you know that's just the opinion side so. It's definitely blue. I think people are still figuring out that process, but I think that there are some potential liabilities there. I definitely agree. It, bl it blends for me too so much that um, it's hard for me to sort of write for, write for developers because sometimes what is a success to a developer will not be a success to a gamer. You know, just because someone has succeeded on the tech side and accomplished something, you know, that doesn't mean the consumer is going to enjoy that. And you know, I have to sometimes if I feel that I can't empathize with both, like I'll decline to review something if I feel you know too close to knowing it under the hood. Um, and in fact, I've trailed off doing reviews a lot um, in general lately because I do feel it's sort of, it's too much of a perspective shift for me. I, that, I still write criticism. Um, I still write about the game as a, as a whole experience, but the idea of a review, um, it, you know, there's a certain expectation there that, you know, I think that it's hard for me to continue fulfilling in the context of the rest of my work. Like, yeah, I'll st I still will write reviews, um, I mean, once in a while, but it's not something that I feel that I could do, um, you know, I would find I would find it hard to, you know, for example, I, I can speak to a developer of say like I spoke to I spoke to them when they were making Dead Space to um, Visceral and you know I talked to them about you know what do you think of survival horror today? So my my articles on Dead Space were in the context of what I had heard from them and what they had told me about what they were aiming to do. Um, therefore, I was able to write about the game. You know, not only how fun is it to play, but also here's what how well did the developers execute on their intention. Um, but if it was something where I had to say stars, 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 I couldn't have done it because I'm not thinking of it as a st strictly as a static product anymore. Hmm. Um, so I do tend to, to like to draw some lines sometimes. Interesting. Yeah, um, and then as Jamin, both of you said, like, if you there are some studios out there that if you give a bad review to one of their games, you can't interview their CFO, you know, on the corporate side, even though one has nothing to do with the other. They will penalize you that way. Hmm. So. Um, I'm going to follow up on that a little bit. I'm, I'm going to uh, quote you, Lee, from your from oh, your great. website. Uh, recently, <laughs> you wrote, uh, "It never fails to amaze me how we as audiences demand increasingly complex and sustaining experiences, and yet every game we get, we bang through as fast as possible so we can get to discussing the next one." Yeah. Um, and that really struck a chord with me because I often feel that way. Um, I'm someone who. Uh, you know, I, I, I love video games and computer games, but I, I, I always like to see them within the larger context of games, uh, the history of games, right? And, and, and uh, you know, we used to have games where you would spend your whole life playing it. You know, it's yeah. like, uh, yeah, I play, I play uh, Ultimate Frisbee. It's not like I played Ultimate Frisbee for two weeks. It's like, yeah, it's, it's part of my life for a few years, you know, when I was in college or whatever. Um, and, and nowadays, it's like you play a game for two weeks, you bang through it, 
and um, and then you want to like move on to the next one. You have that intense conversation, yeah. and, and so it, it it it's curious to me whether you know the the game review which really is about kind of encapsulating that moment of like, okay, I spent two weeks playing this thing and I'm writing it up and then moving on to the next thing. Um, whether that, whether, you know, we, do we need to evolve that? Is, do we need to move beyond the review as like the core thing in which you write critically about games? Like, is that, does that make sense? Like, do we, does it need to evolve into something different or is it always, is there, will there always be a place for the review, the classic review? Well, I, I wrote what I did because I, I don't like thinking of games as finite things. Like, if you remember back when you had an NES, like, you had like three or four cartridges, and you and your friends played those things for years. It was just like whichever one you were in the mood for. Um, and there was a long standing experience. Like, you played Mario Kart with these friends, you played them with that friends. Like, you know, it, was, it became like a fixture of your life. And, you know, granted, now games are so high volume that you're not going to have every game play a permanent role in your life. But the review does define the gameplay as a really closed ended, finite thing. Um, and I wonder if that doesn't, because of Metacritic and all, just encourage people to design games as like quick bang experiences, which I don't think serves the medium that well. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, people listen to albums for years on end, but they still get reviewed the week they come out. So I don't think that there's something unique to gaming that games are these things you cherish forever and therefore shouldn't have a review written about them. But there's a, yeah, there's a dearth of you know sort of years later critical writing about video games for sure. I mean we've we've been getting to do some of that lately on Kotaku. I do a series called Hindsight where right. like games came out like it came out like a year or two ago. Edge Magazine does a rewind feature, which is a similar thing, where they're writing these really magnificent appreciations of games a couple of years after they came out. And those are those the Edge articles are fantastic to read and. You can tell that they're they're written with the sense that you know the game has had time to marinate in their memory and that what was great about that game has kind of risen to the fore and that they're writing it without any sort of pressure that they have to tell somebody whether this thing is worth buying. It's obviously something that's worth remembering and reminiscing over. So it's it's you know assumed to be good or interesting. Um, yeah. But writing like that is very satisfying. I, I think though a lot of people read the reviews out of a sense of whether I should spend sixty dollars on something and so they would want. Yeah, I really, I'm really conflicted about reviews. In general, I, I don't really enjoy reading most of them. Um, I, I think Metacritic is to blame for a lot of it. I think, uh, and this is coming from a guy, I used to write for Pitchfork Media, and we have like a, we have a 10 point, oh, we have like a numerical scale. It's like on to the 100th point. And I remember there were always these weird, oblique discussions about what's the difference between an 8.5 and an 8.7. And like, I remember how meaningless that actually, it felt like it sort of rendered the music really meaningless. And what happens is people kind of go on Pitchfork and they look at their reviews and they just look at the score and then they don't bother to read kind of what's below it because you're trained to just sort of look at it. Um, you guys never ditch, because we don't have numbers in Kotaku. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think numbers for scales, I think are, are, are miserable. I, when, I was, when I was at the journal, I had a short-lived video game colic, uh, column and. Um, I, I, I sent an email to the Metacritic guy, and I was like, hey, you know, I'm starting this video game column in the weekend section, and he's like, well, do you have a number point scale? And I'm like, no, I don't have one. He's like, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you, se you send me the review, and then secretly send me a number not, that wouldn't actually appear in the paper, but just like, just give me like some sort of number so I can throw it up there. And I was like, that doesn't really make any sense. Or we can just yeah. pick one for you. He's we like, can or, just attribute right. your name or to they a can score. Just attribute one for you. So, <laughs> and in case you missed that, by the way, Metacritic is a guy. There is a Metacritic. Yeah, it's literally like <laughs> one, guy. literally one dude. He's not making that up. Yeah, I mean, I think the bigger problem with reviews, I mean, I think there's, there's a difference. I think, Stephen, you're absolutely right. To help people evaluate whether they should purchase a $60 game. But I mean, for me, especially coming out of music criticism, I mean, I had always thought of, and there was this long history of you know, Lester Bangs, and there's a long history of music critics who didn't necessarily think about the album right when it came out. They thought about what they were writing as being this like larger work of, um, this larger work of opinion, right? So it's something that would age well. And I think my problem with a lot of game reviews is that they are sort of important for that week, but not as important if you came back to them like two or three years. And I, I recognize like it's difficult to play a game and then write some epic you know, decades long spanning thing. I think there's definitely like a need to help people sort of evaluate the quality of the game. At the same time, I definitely, I'm much more interested. I would rather wait six weeks after a game came out and read something that I felt like was gonna last the test of time rather than read something that came out the week of. Um, but I recognize that there's definitely like a need. People wanna know, you know, I'm going to GameStop this weekend. What should I be looking for? But I think the more that critics can sort of think of themselves as maybe serving both roles. And I think, you know, you going back to old games, for example, and saying like, how can we reevaluate these or look at these in a, in a larger, uh, in a larger context. I think stuff like that is more interesting to me than kind of the 
the week the week review. So speaking of um, of uh, uh, the difficulty of of looking at a game as an object and um, and and writing that is more about the your personal relationship to the game. Um, there, we used to hear a lot about new games journalism. This was a few years ago. This was kind of like a hot phrase, the new games journalism. And you kind of don't hear so much about it anymore. And it was, looking back on it now, it seems like it's really, was almost just synonymous with Tim Rogers. <laughs> um, and so my question is for you, Stephen. Well, do you, Gillen, do you edit Gillen, Tim Rogers? Yeah. He, he, he writes for you yeah. now, occasionally. Yeah. Do you edit his work? And yeah. what's, Tim what's that files, like? Tim files me 15,000 words, just about once a month. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I edited it. But What's that uh, like? <laughs> it's it's uh, you know some spell checking, some moving of sentences, some like <laughs> trying to trying to improve his jokes a little bit. Really, you give him already. you give him notes and he yeah, of and course. he takes them good. Of course. Nice. Yeah, I mean, um, it, are there are there <laughs> like is is new games journalism just something that got like absorbed by the larger field and and are we now seeing it on 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 blogs and, uh, and what what is new games journalism? I don't know. Right. It was a fr no. you, someone. It was it was, it was um it. it Basically, like Gillen and his friends, um, th these guys in the UK, they started to write like really like they aimed hard for avant garde. I think they were like you know, rather than opening you know in a time when everyone was just writing bullet point reviews, Gillen decides to write you know well I'm sitting here playing this game and then my girlfriend makes me something to eat and like things like that you know right. like they're trying to contextualize games into the context of their life um, you know and then like you know. I'm pressing this, and these ships are happening, and then like you know, I tell her I love her. You know, like you know, like it, right. it was it was it was a way of looking at it that I think wanted to look at games as not an isolated experience, not something that can be given five stars in a magazine. Um, and I do think that you know that you know work like that really did change the way that a lot of people it inspired a lot of people, myself included, to say, hey, people maybe do want to read more thoughtfully about games. Like it, it showed that there's actually an audience for it. Um, so. Now there's you know there's a million blogs where people are writing you know home like homebrew games criticism um, you know there's a million columns where people are talking about how they feel and you know the role that a game has played in their life and explaining the context of why they're responding the way they do um, so I mean I think all all games journalism is new now you know what I mean it's not like as compared to old games journalism <laughs> like before we didn't really have journalism we just had like magazines with rankings you know. Right. Um, go ahead. Well, I, just, I, I think for me, the one thing that worries me, uh, and I hope this sort of evolves long term, is like, you know, you think about that term, new journalism, right, and that involved a set of writers um, going to a place and then writing about that particular place. And I think the concern I have is if it's just people writing about the context and that context is circumscribed by the living room, then I think ultimately that's going to be a project that doesn't really succeed. But if it involves people going places and I guess um, who did this game in life? Sorry, go ahead. But the idea of like when Tom Wolfe was hanging out, out with the, the, the biker gangs, electric Kool-Aid acid yeah, test, yeah. he was going somewhere. And the idea with a lot of games journalism of this type is that it's the idea that the game itself and where you go in the game is the, that, that's the journey, that, that gaming journalism can be travel journalism and that you have gone to this place. It was a challenge that I faced at MTV when I first was writing for MTVnews.com. And initially, we didn't use first person at all in anything that we did. And it was OK for the, those in our newsroom who were writing about music and they were writing about the award show or the movies or whatever. But for me, I said, you know, I've gotten to the 25th hour of this game and something very interesting has happened and I'm not sure that enough other people have experienced this that I can go find somebody to quote to have talk about this thing. It would be much more liberating for me to just talk about this exotic place I've been to. So in that sense, I think there would be some validity to staying in your living room and attempting new games journalism. But yeah, that's fair. Going out I, and hanging out with the bikers who play games would be good, I too. <laughs> I feel like what Stephen is talking about sort of distills this idea of new games journalism down to the fact that we can't necessarily treat them like objective products because ev many different individuals are going to have different experiences. So it's okay, you know, it's, it's giving permission to the writer to say I when they're playing and to say, you know, to articulate here's what I discovered, you know, and maybe you can learn something from it even though it's not necessarily going to be your experience. I mean, there's such a hesitance to put an I um, you know, behind when we're writing about games because it's like, it's a product and you know, like it is an object that you are going to interact with, not me, but you know, it's giving permission yeah. to the eye. Yeah, and I, and I think that, 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 uh, that notion of, of games journalism as, as a kind of travel journalism is really, really interesting one. Um, let me just ask you guys, uh, are there journalists and writers and critics from outside the field of games that you find particularly inspiring that you really look up to or that you you draw um, uh, you know a lot of inspiration from yeah one of, one of my favorite models and um, 
it might be a little odd, but if those who have HBO ever seen a show called Real Sports, which is essentially a 60 minutes of sports, I don't watch much sports at all, um, other than when I accidentally come across sports entertainment on Monday night. Um, that's a pro wrestling joke. No one, no one gets my pro wrestling jokes except Evan. Evan Narciss, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but <laughs> but uh, Real Sports is a show hosted by Brian Gumbel, and it's about football, baseball, basketball, sports I don't really care about anymore. But with, and, 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 to, and the point being, topics that, and, and uh, activities that people could deem as frivolous. The outside world could say, oh, these are just games. These are just people doing something silly. It has no consequence on you know, how we live or how we die or how we pay our taxes or anything else like that. And yet they might manage to find stories driven by human interests, stories that you care about the people in them. They connect to life. They tell you things about what it's like to just exist on this planet. It happens to be through the lens of sports. For them to do something that feels so substantial and emotionally satisfying, about something as frivolous as sports, for me, is inspiration every month when I watch that show for what reporting about games could be. I mean, probably most things in The New Yorker, you know, like Dana Goodyear, I like um, Malcolm Gladwell's, uh, not so much, I like his New Yorker, I like his journalist pieces, not so much his books, but uh, uh, I like This American Life a lot. I think in particular, like, focusing on one, they have a good theme every week, which is amazing, and then also picking one thing, an interaction, a conversation, whatever it is, and then sort of creating this narrative and this dialogue, which I think is really, I think that's really fascinating. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I guess you've heard Life Well Wasted. I have. Is obviously, a, yeah. um, draws a lot of inspiration from, yeah, from that style. And I hope um, there's like more stuff like that. Yeah. Because, I mean, and that's, I, th I think what's great about, um, about Robert Ashley's stuff is that like, it's done in a way that, you know, he, he's not really interviewing developers, really. He's interviewing people who play games and sort of why they play them. And I think he's just getting better at it over time. So I'm very excited for the stuff that he's doing. And I guess I don't, I, I also enjoy um, all the things that Jamin mentioned. Um, but I don't really have a specific um, person that I can point to. Um, but there is, there is a stylistic thing, which is exactly what he said, when there's a particular element that is looked at in an interesting way rather than a traditional like end-to-end, -end, like bird's-eye view of something. Um, yeah, so whenever I read something like that, I always find it pretty inspiring. Nice. Um, there is a, I mean, for a long time, I, I felt like there was kind of a huge gap between uh, the game press and whenever games got talked about in the mainstream press, <clears throat> it just seemed uh, kind of flat-footed and they were always sort of like weirdly out of it. They still um, are. And, and yeah, so my question is, is that gap still there or is it closing or what do you guys think? Do you still read stuff that kind of makes you cringe when you, like in Newsweek or... Or you know, time or something I, like that. I always cringe when I read Newsweek. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Not Newsweek. I meant time. <laughs> time. Yeah, I used to. Yeah. We have. <laughs> I yeah. Never mind. Go ahead. Yeah. Talk about that gap. That huge gap. Yeah. Recently. Uh, well, I, I feel like the mainstream me media couldn't even be convinced to pay attention significantly to video games until they could attach numbers like one billion to Modern Warfare. But you even know what then, I mean? right? Yeah, I mean... but even then, it's like this, this, like they're focusing on you know high, really great graphics that earn a lot of money. Like there's still there's still a major um, failure of understanding in the mainstream press um, about. Uh, why we are like why all of us are in this room and like why we care about video games why we're affected by them um and you know i think that's also it's not uncommon i mean we're all here because we're really into this but i don't really know anyone who kind of who really gets what i do that well um you know even the people who understand what i do are like oh yeah so like i just got i just beat this level like did you play that game like you know that th there's Elevated dialogue, elevated discourse around video games, the sort that we'd all like to see happen, is not at all common outside of our niche. There's like, you know, there's still, you know, very little understanding that it's even possible to have that. Um, so I guess you can't blame, you know, when print doesn't really have a lot of money to waste and, and you know, TV doesn't have a lot of time, um, you can't really blame them for not really willing to like delve into and invest and psychoanalyze something that they're, you know, not really having any understanding of yet to begin with. Um, however, you know, I guess. Um, I mean, gosh, they're slow in the uptake, otherwise they would be online more. Um, so I don't know what to say. I think they're pretty effed. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think for me, the, the, the gap is emblematic in the way that you look at most newspapers, the way that they actually, the war, like video game titles, like if you look at the style guys at most major publications, so everything else, the, you know, the other major pillars of entertainment, film, television, 
um, literature is all put in italics. But you look at games almost across the board, it's put in the same, it's treated the same way that like the Toyota Prius is, right? Like so a they, device. Exactly, or a product, like a yeah. device mm -hmm. or a product. Yeah. It's something you write about in a functional way, right? It's not something that you So wait, what was the style? Oh, the normally journal. it's like italics, quotes for everything else, and then yeah. video games is not Nothing granted the, the same. Journal, okay. uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't think of a single publication that actually that actually does it. When wow, I was that's the, really interesting. When it's I was definitely the journal, it's still thought of as so a product. Emblematic. I used to yeah, uh, when I was at the journal, I used to like put it in quotes and let the copy desk try, see if they could see, yeah. see if I could sneak it into the newspaper. Yeah. So I mean, I, and I think Lee's right. I mean, I think part of the problem is that video games are coming to maturity at a time when traditionally the publications that would be covering them are sort of falling into decline. And when you go into decline, you become more conservative. And so mm -hmm. video games are this big question marks like so why devote time and effort. Right, you look at most major news publications, they don't have a dedicated video games person, right? It's usually rolled in with the rest of the tech stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a, that's a big problem. I mean, so there aren't resources to devote there. It's great for us, though. I mean, it's a great opportunity for us to tell good stories, but there's definitely a huge, huge gap. Uh, my, my experience in the mainstream media wasn't so bad. I, I wrote stories that I found very satisfying for the New York Times about five years ago when I was writing about a piece a month for them. The Times is pretty uh, good. And they're, yeah, and they're, they're pretty enlightened about a lot of things, and they have a number of people who write about games regularly for them. Uh, when I, I got hired by MTV, because MTV News, uh, you know, think what you will of MTV, but they've always tried to figure out, okay, what are the kids into now? And they realized a few years ago that the kids were into video games, and they, <laughs> they, they decided to, that they, they didn't like the kind of coverage they'd been doing on video games beforehand. They felt like it was that it was so shallow, it was just having a celebrity who did voice acting in a game come in and, and, and talk for a little bit, and they put that into like a 30-second on-air package, and they knew that the gamers didn't respect that, that nobody, they didn't really get anything out of that. So they decided, as they had a lot of uh, reporters on the movie beat and the music beat and what have you, um, these are the people who didn't go on, go on camera, these weren't the Kurt Loaders and John Norris's, um, that, oh, we should bring in a person to cover the video game beat. And Frank, as you alluded to in the introduction, that, that, that job was created, and I was lucky enough to get it first. Russ Frushtick has that job now. Uh, and that was cool, because th that was an outlet, a mainstream outlet, that was trying to figure out, okay, how can we actually cover games? And they actually put video game titles in quotes. Do they? They did I not italicize them, which they would do for movies, and I think TV shows, uh, but, but video games at least got quotes. So there was like a, like a half step toward legitimacy. <laughs> Um, but but t Lee's absolutely right that one of the major problems is that most mainstream outlets do not have a person who covers video games full time for them. They certainly have people on their staff who play video games, but not people whose job it is to sort of know what's up and then write about it. Or it's definitely whatever. challenging, like I said, for me to explain to average and not especially enthusiast video like you know your average game enthusiast just wants to blow stuff up right now you know they're not they don't really care to look at it yet in the way that we do so if we can't if I can't convince my own age peers who are also gamers I'm not going to convince some 40 50 year old guy who's got a you know news desk budget you know to let me have some column inches most of the well, time I think people I think the average gamer likes talking about the game that they're into yeah, well, on, on some levels on some levels yeah but you know even like I'll have people who are like gamers, and I'm like, I tell them what I do, and they're like, so do you like play video games? I'm like, yeah. Like, how am I gonna write about them? No, no, I don't play them. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like, like there's, there's still these prejudices, like active, like you know, even people who are supposed to understand me, people shopping at like GameStop, like don't, yeah. don't, you know. So, I, I mean, I think part of the problem is that there isn't. We haven't developed a vernacular, a common vernacular. That's for the games. topic of my kill screen column, by oh, the way. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're still working on that. People know what a long shot is, right? They know what narrative devices look like in literature. I think part of the issue is that it's turning those conversations about blowing stuff up and being able to convince people, like, no, 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 these are meaningful conversations that you're having. Like, it is not frivolous to play, you know, to talk about prestiging and modern warfare. These are not ancillary conversations about something that you do in your spare time like these can be central to your you know cultural life and getting people to sort of take the things that they're already discussing these inter these you know extra game experiences that they're already having okay. right exactly and it's not even like about using different words it's just about saying like look this is actually important and meaningful and you shouldn't feel embarrassed about you know telling your parents or your friends or this is not something that you know more than talking about literature or anything like that anything yeah. else um, so, S Stephen and Jamin, you, you were both invited to participate in this uh, game club discussion, which was 
which was uh, sponsored by what? It's, uh, was it Slate? Mm -hmm. um, and can you just like? I was uh, in that too. Were you in that too? I <laughs> yeah. thought it was just these two guys. No. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to find something that all three of you haven't done together. But uh, let me just cross that off. We're a small family. Um, so the three, the three of you were in that. Could you just share with us a little bit about what that conversation was was like and what that was about and what yes, came out of it? Yeah, because yeah. you guys did it together. You get, mm -hmm. I got bumped. Oh, you, he was actually yeah. in a oh, so different maybe year. Maybe it's like yeah. a it used to be those. And then I'll ask you the gender question. <laughs> it was right. It was, yeah. it was it was it was me and guy. Who else was in our our game club? Chris. It was Chris Wellentrop, who was a uh, writer for Slate, and Seth Rizal, Seth Rizal, New York Times. And uh, so, what was the idea behind that? And what was the, the idea the, was the, that the, the idea was outcome. that they had been regularly, I guess, at least annually, maybe more often than that, uh, assembling a who's who of game uh, movie critics and having them essentially write long emails to each other. Uh, that would be published about what was interesting in, in film for the year or what have you. And it was, there was no more specific um, directive than that of can you kind of replicate that, uh, you know, sort of have these long-form emails to each other about games and about what was sort of wonderful about games in the past year. Um, it was fun. Yeah. Was it contentious at times, I guess? I don't know. Our, I mean, ours was No, ours was like super easy. I felt like we all Except just Except about like... Uncharted, right? Oh, yeah. Well, no, what we about had, Uncharted? Well, we had different... <laughs> like, I think it's awesome. We think uh, it's... Uh, no, I think Uncharted banal. is awesome. No, no. I, it... <laughs> <laughs> all right. I just think that if you're like, he's like, he, he used these really vaunted words to talk about like Nathan Drake. And I'm like, come on. It's like Indiana Jones, dude. <laughs> like, it's oh, so real. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. Like, Jamin J J like, used, used some very high level prose to talk about his response to that Call character. High insecurities. Yeah. <laughs> and I felt that, you know, that isn't like, I love Uncharted, okay, but I'm not thinking it's literary. And I think that was where we. I, I had an epiphanal experience playing that game. And no, we, we, we like I riffed on each other friendly, but it, there was always a great respect for everybody's opinions. It was a positive and I thought awesome Well, I mean, discourse. so you, you guys know each other's work and opinion yeah, we, and attitudes. We're is there, is, are there deep disagreements on any issues? If it's not Uncharted 2, is there something else that you feel like is a genuine difference in the way that you approach these questions or are you guys 100% in agreement on, on all these issues? Uh, people disagree with me behind my back and they're nice to my face. So I don't <laughs> No, I don't know. Now, now that now that Ngai is no longer writing, I don't argue with anyone about anything. <laughs> I know, I'm not I'm not really into RPGs. Yeah, no, no. yeah, we don't agree on that. So yeah. you love RPGs and I wouldn't say I love them. Yeah. I like them a lot. I like Japan. I like Japanese design a lot. I know that's not a popular opinion these days. Right. It's like Wait, it's, who here has played Portal? All right. Keep your hand up if Portal has a story. N guy and I had a big fight over whether Portal had a story. <laughs> How is that even a question? And I said it. And I said it did. Portal and is. And he fought me tooth and nail that it didn't have a story. That's, wow. That, that, yeah. He's argumentative. <laughs> Thank you, Room. So at least we. <laughs> that settles that. Um, all right. Well. Uh, so. So. But actually, you yeah. Know, go ahead. Um, I mean, yeah. There. There is. There is something. Uh, there are certain things that come up a lot, and, and it's going to even divide our readership, and I think that all of us have touched on it professionally, and that's when we go into talking about things like gender or race or things that some readers say, oh, well, this isn't really relevant to writing about this game, or why are you talking about this? And then you get the, the old canard of, it's just a game. Yeah. And for a lot of people, that's how they kind of describe where the limitation is on what you should be talking about. This is something that people use. Uh, a lot of folks will use when they see video games being attacked for causing real world violence. They say, no, it's not doing that because games are just, you know, that Grand Theft Auto is just a game. It can't possibly be inspiring anybody to violence. If we write about uh, how women are portrayed in video games, uh, should there, uh, I wrote a piece about um, recent modern warfare games like Battlefield Bad Company and, and MAG, so near future games that don't depict any women in the fighting force and saying, you know, uh, sort of why is that? And so there were those who said, well, it has to be realistic and there, there aren't many women in combat. And other people saying, this is just a game. Why are you even worrying about whether or not women are in there? And other people saying, well, I'm a woman or I'm a man and I would like to be able to play as, as a woman. And so I find that a lot of the social issues yeah. when they come up are things that some reporters and some, some you know, folks in the media will even say, why are you wasting your time writing about that? Some readers will say that as well, and so that becomes something where there's a, a disagreement. I definitely remember when you asked me in the beginning, like, what's the hardest thing about my job? I mean, I feel like 
that's that's what I want to focus on as social issues. I once wrote a column for Kotaku, I think before you were there, called like it's not just a game, and it was an attempt to persuade the gamer audience why they shouldn't dismiss these kinds of conversations. I just filed a piece for GamePro about why we should care about the race debate and not try to brush it under the table because it's just a video game. Like it's just a game is like my people who say it's is the it's just a game thing is my least favorite you know thing about my work. And the res when I said that I don't really like gamers, it's I don't like when. I try to articulate the things that Steven was saying as important, and I get a rush of 100 comments of like, shut up, bitch, who cares? This is why women shouldn't play video games. Like, you know, like, <laughs> seriously. Um, go ahead. I would say, I mean, at the very least, we should be at least a little flattered. I mean, people often say that about film, right? It's just a movie. Why are you concerned about that? Right. It's just a book or whatever. Right. So at least we're sort of part of the conversation <laughs> now. <laughs> um, so, so, Lee, you write about uh, occasionally about about gender and and uh, but it's by no means uh, the central focus of, of of your work and your writing. But my question is like, is is games journalism as much of a boys' club as game development is? And do you ever have to struggle with that? Um, I think it's probably less. Um, I don't think that any of my peers here or anywhere else um, notices my gender. I really feel that way about, about the other writers. I don't feel that anyone makes an issue out of it. Um, you know, there are sometimes that, because I can't have any other perspective than a woman's perspective, there will be times that my colleagues will say, you know, well, what do you think of this and how would you as a woman respond to this? Um, but um, I think that, I would, I would guess that games development is a lot less familiar with, um, you know, having women involved. Um, I mean, granted, with GDC this year, I saw the closest thing to gender diversity than, than I've seen at any other year. So I'm not saying that, like, games development is a hostile place for women. I'm just saying that, you know, I'm much more likely to be asked about my gender on the development side than on the, than on the writing side. Yeah. Um, Jamma, we talked about uh, your magazine, Kill Screen which uh, the first issue is just out. Um, and I guess my question there is, had you not heard that print was dead? <laughs> did, this, did this not occur to you? What, what were you thinking? Uh, it's a good question. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> provocative question from Mr. Lance. Um, I do think, well, a couple, this is like a really long answer. Well, I think first off, um, I don't think print is necessarily dead in the sense that experiences with tactile objects are not dead. We still live pre-singularity, right? We still pick things up. <laughs> we still hold them, right? So people are still interested in design. You even think about things like, you know, kin the Kindle, all these ebook readers, right? They're all built around ergonomic experiences with this thing, about this particular thing. And that's kind of the way that I feel about magazines or, you know, in our case, you know, mini books or whatever you want to call it. I mean, I do think my interest in doing something like Kill Screen stemmed around, I'm interested in good design and I'm interested in high quality. I think that's the only, I, I think that you know, most publications should decrease frequency and increase quality. Mm -hmm. So we're you know, shooting for a quarterly basis, right? I don't think I could do something like this every single week, maybe someday, I'd love to be able to do that. But even then, right, I want something that people are gonna hold and hold on to and they're not just gonna sort of throw it in the trash. So I really think that's the only way that print, the print side is actually gonna work. It's funny because like people say like, you know, people won't pay for content, people won't pay for content, but people pay for access to content, right? So they'll pay for some, they'll pay for the conduit, but they won't pay for the thing on the other end. So people pay for broadband, they pay for electricity, they pay for all these things that deliver all this free content. And then kind of that's the way I think about the magazine. It's like, you're not necessarily, all of the words are very valuable to me personally. I recognize that, you know, sort of one of the new economics of online is that individual words are not really worth anything anymore. But they will pay for something that they can hold and show off to their friends. It's more about the experience of reading a particular thing than about, um, about the words inside of it. But the words are obviously very important. Like good writing is extremely, extremely important. It's not just filled with, you know, not just filled with you know, YouTube comments or anything like that. I don't think that that would sell, um, at least not yet. And where, where can I purchase this if I wanted to buy a copy Online, of Killscreen? Online, killscreenmagazine.com. All right. And I have some here if you would like to buy one off me here. Nice. Um, Steven, I wanted to ask you, like a, a couple years ago, we had an interesting conversation and you were saying, when you go to a place like Austin, uh, there is a sense of game development community that's very palpable, and you really get a sense of like, oh, this is they're, they're game developers here, and they they form a, a coherent, uh, uh, you know, group of people, and that that's kind of missing from New York City, and that you were hoping that that you know you were wondering where where you know where to find that or whether that could right. be cultivated more. And I guess my question is that you still feel that way, and what what can we do about it, like? 
Well, you, we're you, in this room now. I mean, like right, you bring up one of my failures, Frank. Well, no, <laughs> what? Because two years ago we talked about that, and the idea was that I was going to have these uh, these grand ra round tables. That's of, true. Of yeah, game you did have a plan York, for that. I, nothing, nothing happens. There's yeah, many, <laughs> many. Maybe I stole your idea many, again. Many, maybe, this, yeah. maybe this is it. <laughs> maybe this is it. Here we are. It's finally <laughs> happened. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess one of the things that I've I've been fortunate to have is the ability to think of a, a lot of ideas for projects and things like that. But follow through is sometimes hard, and it doesn't happen. It wasn't. I don't think that it was so much that uh, when I was in Austin, I could smell the video game development, you know, sort of coming out of the. Let me tell you three for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can, you can smell a lot of game development at E3, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, 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 but what I was able to do in Austin was able to say, okay, well, these people made Metroid Prime, and these people made Ultima Online, and these people made, you know, whatever else, and sort of go from door to door with the MTV cameras at the time, and of course everybody opened their doors to us, and we were able to do that. Uh, it's, it, it, that was it, but even just a couple of years ago, and this is one of the things that's so interesting about this living history of games that Lee was talking about in the beginning, is how fast things are changing. And so just a couple of years ago, yeah, a couple of years ago, what seemed to matter more, and almost seemed to matter exclusively, were the bigger games and the things that got so much more hype. And I feel like the world, the gaming world, and even the outside world is much more tolerant and interested in the smallest of projects, the the one person iPhone game, or the stuff that I guess we had, we had thought was going to be left behind as just a memory of stuff people were doing in the 80s in the, in the garage, and nobody would care about that anymore. Nobody would have access to play that stuff. And that's come back. So I, I look at New York differently. I probably need to therefore rejigger my idea, but that it is full of people that are making these kind of you know, yeah. games at, at the smaller scale that are yeah. that is interesting. Is anything else? In fact, I hear Area Code has a few great projects. <laughs> it's true. Who's that? <laughs> that, are, that are in the works. No, I love I love that I love that that, that that's a great yeah, yeah. That, that's a reason for New York to be ascendant. I also yeah. want to like point out the local game. IGDA chapter has a monthly game demo night. They're doing one on Monday. Um, it's probably information on the website, and uh, I'm. I'm hoping to go. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, all right. So a couple more quick questions, and then we're going to open it up to the to the crowd and, and get you guys some questions. But like, um, so there are a bunch of students. Like, raise your hand if you're a student. Uh, raise your hand if you're a student. So like about, about half of us or a little bit less are, are students. If I'm a student and I want to become a, a, a professional uh, writer about games the way you guys are, what should I be studying right now? Something else. Do something else. Go into finance. <laughs> don't try. Finance. Don't try. <laughs> yeah. Something that'll make you money. <laughs> um, Go to business school. No. I, you know, honestly, I, I think, ugh, that's a, that's a really tough question. If you want to be a games reporter? Yeah, you what be should I be reporter? studying if, See, I, if, I think I, if eventually I want to be, you know, be like a, a Stephen Totillo? Well, you got, you just, I mean, writing. You just got to keep writing. We mm -hmm. sometimes get people who, they apply for work at Kotaku and they tell us they love playing games, but they don't have anything they can show us of what they've written. 20 years ago, that would have been okay because where are you going to get published other than, you know, like from on the Xerox machine? But these days, you can have your own blog and you can write and, um, so anybody can theoretically have stuff to show us and say, hey, this is the kind of stuff I'm writing. And because anybody can write, everybody is out there writing at least poorly. So you want to <laughs> distinguish yourself by writing well, which would be the second requirement. There aren't that many paid opportunities to cover games to do it well. Some people see it as a transition that they could go from there to going into game development. Some people have kind of had to do that because, say, like in San Francisco, some of the games media opportunities have dried up. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's sort of like the NBA. You're, you're not all going to make it and be able to dunk like Jamin, but, you know, <laughs> some will if they keep plugging away. So classes that, that are about writing, so writing classes and, and, and journalism yeah, I, classes, presumably. I think you need to be clear about what it is that you want to do, because I think a lot of people get into it because they love games and not because they love writing. You have to love writing, because if you love games, that will be, yeah, right, if you don't love writing and reporting, it will be unfulfilling to you, hmm. because eventually you will reach a point, right, where you've gotten all the free games that you can get, and you're all of a sudden say, okay, well, what's next? So if you don't love the craft itself, um, I think that going into games journalism, or just you know journalism in general, I think is going to be a bad move. I, I think the other thing is like read things outside of games, right? So look at what professionals have done in other areas. Um, you know, read 
good publications that produce good work and think about like what would be like read the stuff that the New Yorker has written about video games. There's only a couple pieces. There's maybe you know a hand could the could be piece. There's a will Wright piece. Read those because those are New Yorker stories first that happen to be about video games and not the other way around because they're well structured and well edited. So think about those and those will be much much more useful to you. Um, and but I think they're not the best pieces of games. Well, I'm not yeah, I was, I was, I, I, I'm just, I don't think either one of those pieces are. Fantastic. Did the person who write them, is there, are they in here? Good, okay. Um, I'm a but they're good. I mean, they're, they're I'm just saying, like, a, just, hey, we're uh, just talking sorry. about you. <laughs> just just because it's in the New Yorker, I don't, I don't think necessarily no, I'm just means saying, that it was. No, but I'm saying the point is that like, people who write yeah. for New York, I just, you need to love writing itself, and you don't need to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, real quick, favorite piece? Do, do you guys, does it pop into your head if I asked you, like, a favorite piece you've done, a favorite piece of reporting or criticism or writing? Of is there own. one thing, yeah, of, of your own, own that pops oh. into your head? Um, mm. <laughs> oh, that's cute. I like that. Uh, what's the favorite thing I've written? No? I, like I one think, like, defining so, thing, like the time so many, you wrote so about the, greats, the new there's Sony. So many. <laughs> so many. <laughs> Come on. We don't put review scores on our reviews, but we do put scores on our articles, and I've given all mine a 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> They're really right. good. If, is, is, was something pop into your head, Lee? Um, actually, I, the two that pop into my head, one is my kill screen article lately, because yeah. you know I, just, I can only remember six months back. And which, <laughs> whichever my my other favorite was was for you, and it was probably one that we worked on together. Um, he is a great editor. Um, so I liked the one that I did about the um, the broken girls hentai game for you. That might be yeah. one of my faves. Um, yeah, right, I, so I enjoyed yeah. writing about the people who make. Massage applications for the Xbox 360. That was like, <laughs> it was the rage last year, and yeah. it was like there was this gold rush of people who thought that if all they needed to do was add a little vibrating functionality that could be manually controlled for their Xbox indie game, and that they'd make so much money. And so I interviewed like 13 people who were doing that, including a stand up comedian in Michigan who made a game about. Uh, killing communists while collecting jelly beans, and he included a little massage vibration mode on the side of his game. And he thought that would be the big hit. That was a fun story. Right? I, I, That's my best. I think probably my favorite is I, I would like to take credit being the first person to write about Wii elbow and tendonitis. It was oh, like, nice. like a week after the Wii came out, and uh, getting the I can't remember Perrin Ka uh, Perrin Kaplan yeah. oh, saying like the Wii is not an exercise device. <laughs> That, that felt really good. Nice. Yeah. Did your arm break down that quickly? Is that no, no, no. I found lots of other people who've been okay. playing Raven Rabbit. It's too long. <laughs> um, okay, so real quick, uh, before we open it up, uh, are there any, are you guys, so do you, are you sitting on any scoops right now that you could let us into, you guys? Like, do you have any information? No. So clearly, you're all journalists. You probably all have yeah. something that you can't say. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Because it's news and it hasn't been broken yet. But is there something that's right on the edge that you could just share with us? <laughs> just let it just spill. Just like, spill a little something. Just something. Spill? Oh God. Anything? You gotta, no, you got to take me out and give me several drinks. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then I start to brag about what I know that you don't know. But That's what I, I want to hear. But you need just to buy all the drinks first. Play, no, no, I'm too sober. Oh, you heard it here, folks. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> PlayStation Four. Um, there's a. There's a. Anything? There's a. <laughs> Sony's gonna have 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 me. Uh, wow, <laughs> I think it's true. I think he actually kind of just said something he wasn't supposed to say. What'd you say? He said PlayStation <laughs> 4. He's not even paying attention. Yeah, PlayStation 4. Yeah. Oh. Nintendo's currently duct taping two you. Wii's together. <laughs> 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 there is a, a a mysterious jack on the base of the the PlayStation Move controller. That I saw for the first time on. Uh, ah, then, interesting, mysterious. I've, I've asked the uh, yeah, mysterious second Vibration? port, a second port on the bottom. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll be writing about this port among other things. Okay. The talkers, <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's um, good stuff. All right, so let's let's <laughs> let's open it up to the to the uh, to the crowd and see if there's anybody any questions. Um, do, let's start over here, um, gentleman with the hand. <laughs> <laughs> twinkling, <laughs> twinkling fingers. Uh, I wanted to ask. Do you think there's something, uh, when it comes to video game reviews, uh, do you think video game reviews are inherently less subjective because of like the technical side than say like music or movie reviews? Whereas like, you know, you, know, you, you can argue all you want that uh, Britney Spears is a better singer than Aretha Franklin, but you can't really argue that uh, Red Steel has better graphics than uh, Call of Duty or something like that. Sure you can. Yeah, you can. Sure. Yeah, uh, but I uh, Red Steel Two is yeah. some might find to be more beautiful than uh, than Call of Duty, right? Like uh, Perfect Dark versus Call of Duty. 
Uh, I thought that Elvis alien was kind of cool looking. <laughs> <laughs> Is there another example? Because I, I feel like there's a legitimate, a, yeah, a legitimate I, I, point. Yeah. I think the problem is it's like a, the template approach, right? So yeah. feeling like you have to talk about graphics for every single game. Because not every game graphics are going to be the most distinguishing but, feature. But, but there are some aspects of games where you right. can point to and say, this is simply broken. Which you really oh, okay. usually I, can't I say that about a movie. So he's saying, is, like, is there an element of writing that will always have to wrestle with the fact that there are some objective things because there's a, such a strong element of engineering in, in these either creative works, but there's also there's engineering in them. I've struggled with this. At, you know, a lot of the games that I love are pretty broken. Like, you know, like I love games, you know, there's some games that I think are brilliant and super, super fun, but they look like crap and they're full of bugs. Like, so what is my obligation as a reviewer to tell you, you know, it depends on what you value, you know what I mean? Like, that's something that, again, is What's another... What's an example of that? Of a crappy, uh, broken Uncharted. game that you love. Is what's wow. the new one that you like? Better? <laughs> Just trying to get her going. No, no, I'm saying no. Uncharted 2, if you were going to tick all the boxes, I would have to give it 100, but it just doesn't move me. You know what right, I mean? Yeah. Like, that's another issue where I look at a game that's technically brilliant. They, they uh, no made. No More Heroes 2, that would be yours. No right? More Heroes 2. Yeah, no Heroes 2, yeah. Sort of broken. Yeah, yeah, sort of. Well, I mean, not yeah. sort of. I, I don't think it's broken, but there, <laughs> there, there are some design issues that maybe they could have done better. Um, I love all the Silent Hills, even though the combat is crap, you know? So it's like, you know, I can't tell you, don't buy this, because I did, and I loved it, and I wasn't frustrated by the fact that it was broken. You know what I mean? So there is definitely, definitely a schism that I encounter um, on the technical side versus the experiential side. And that's a lot of what has led me away from reviews lately, because I haven't yet been able to reconcile it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the art of review, deciding, like, when, I mean, I don't know, or, or load time. I, like, did tenny, does taking a game taking too long to load, does that qualify? As yeah, a, I, that doesn't bother me, but I know it, it but drives my audiences crazy. So, so it's I, like, it depends. I guess know your audience. and Yeah, know your audience. I don't think load times are all that important. No. Um, I'm not even bothered by cutscenes. <laughs> the gentleman in the hat. Um, shout it out, yeah. There's a lot of hats. We'll do the red hat, and then we'll here. do the green hat. It's like uh, Super a, Mario Bros. top hat in the back. <laughs> Mario, <laughs> then Luigi. There's three hats. Yeah. <laughs> red hat. Yeah, red my hat. question is, I mean, basically, you know, there's all this talk about legitimacy of the game industry, and there's a lot of, like, comparing it to the other industries, like the typical entertainments and film. And I, I feel like I see a lot of writers trying to like compare film to games as if like the goals of a film are the same as the goals of a game. And I was just wondering how you guys kind of like at GDC that I went to a talk called Five Ways a Video Game Can Make You Cry, which I feel like it's like a big goal of a video yeah. or a movie, not necessarily of a game, even though it's kind of interesting. So that's a simple question. Um. Yeah, I, I see a lot of that too, and I've actually written before about why we shouldn't do that. I mean, I do. I mean, there's there's some when I look at parallels between the different different industries. It's as a critic, like sometimes I'm like, well, what does music critic? What can I learn about game criticism from music criticism? Because it, that's another thing that is subjective and experiential. Um, so in terms of how I approach something writing wise, I do sometimes make comparisons, but there is this huge eagerness for games to have the same exact kind of response as like film does. Like you need to, you know, you need to you need to like be moved by it and cry, you know what I mean? So it's like, th making people experience emotion is always a goal, um, but I, I'm sort of with you in that I think that let games, let games affect people because of their own strengths rather than trying to compare them to other media and how they have affected people. Nice, uh, green hat? Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so I guess for me, um, um, I'm really interested in this idea of treating video games as an art form. Um, for me, my background is in film and television, um, so it's like that, that comment you made about comparing video games to, to film, I've always been kind of invested in, but for me, what kind of really stands, up, stands out about the video games, I guess, is playing Bioshock, and that great twist where you realize that your actions are kind of controlled by the game. Now, oh. Thanks, <laughs> Rule number one of game hey, Is there anyone in here who... Who hasn't played Bioshock yet and wants yeah. to? Don't ruin that much. For I'm sorry. You. We're kidding. Go oh. ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh my uh, we're sorry. Finish your question. <laughs> yeah. No. Of course. We're just Come kidding. On. Finish your question. But I guess like for me, that um, that moment in that game was just like when I realized how powerful it was because like this kind of a this kind of entertainment medium is just like like your participation in it is so direct. Um, I was just really wondering, like, what you guys think of video games and how, it, uh, like, what aspects kind of validate it for you as an art form. Um, I think it's that. Really no, it's that kind of stuff, right? And I think 
to bounce off your question, that's the continuum I see, right? It's in terms of like, oh, the end of Shawshank Redemption made me feel like this, right? Video games made me feel, and those are signs I think of, of good art forms. I saw X Painter and it moved me like this, right? And there are different ways to kind of get there and video games do it differently. But I think those are the things for me that are most important in video games. There's like finishing Heavy Rain, for example, there were like a couple of those moments that made me feel like X or whatever. Everybody can feel differently about it. Bioshock 2 has a similar moment at the end that's like, you know, it makes you feel like it makes. You, I don't want to talk about it, obviously because people have finished the game. But the point being that like those are the those are what the, those are what are important to me. And I think having that, like inserting that I into the conversation, right? Because like I watched a movie, but I always talk about things I did in a game, and that makes them feel more valuable to me. Yeah, I don't. I don't know a good argument for uh, why games wouldn't be art. So I just kind of assume that they are. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm yeah. sure somebody could in, invalidate well that that I logic think. by saying, you know, this bottle is an art. Or well, I guess. Some people would say it was. Um, but the people at Office I, Snacks might I think, have a word. I, I think that some of the reason why movies are talked about in context with video games, uh, why even in this room we couldn't necessarily assume that everybody had played through Bioshock a few minutes ago, was is because games are long and they become these lonely experiences. Even if millions of people have played Modern Warfare 2, we can't assume that they have all played through the campaign, that they've all seen scene X or scene Y and experienced it. Whereas a, a Day after Avatar, you know, does its box office records in, uh, you know, for its first weekend, I can write about uh, with with a safe assumption that enough millions of people have all experienced the exact same two and a half hours or whatever it was, and therefore I can refer to a scene in it. And there's a common cultural literacy. And one of the big issues with writing about games is that you can't assume uh, high gaming literacy even among like the most passionate gamers that read your stuff because a lot of people don't have the money or the time or the interest to play that many games. So I feel like I have this kind of mutant experience of gaming. Uh, every year for the last like six years, I've written a list of, published a list of all the games I've finished, and it's like an absurd amount of games. And yet the list, I think it's like it was thirty something games that I'd finished in the past year, and I'd played like over a hundred or something for fun. Like, how did I do that? Because a lot of publishers sent me games for free because I have a very patient wife, like many reasons <laughs> for how I was able to do that. But most people can't, and so it's very hard to even ha have a common conversation. Uh, you know, you all could answer the question about Portal because Portal's a pretty short game. So we all at least have an opinion, a pretty informed opinion about whether there's a story there because we've been through that experience. Uh, but it's really hard with a lot of games. And so you wind up going to movies, TV, songs, things that are shorter that more people have experienced for mm -hmm. just reference. Um, why don't we go here to the gentleman in the red shirt. Hi. Um, well, uh, relating to what you said right now, and earlier you said, uh, you spoke about like, how you feel there's a rush to get the next game all the time, and how maybe that's affecting review scores and uh, might be uh, devaluing longer games. But do you feel sometimes that as a games journalist, you have a disconnect from actual gamers? Because for me, for instance, due to financial constraints or time constraints, I do not play every game that comes out. And to me, there is that much, uh, for instance, Team Fortress 2, is something that I played for, I still play since it came out, since the beta, and it's amazing to me, and it's grown and it's become part of me, and I've met friends through it, and uh, it's a much more powerful experience than what you spoke about with two weeks. Do you feel sometimes that maybe uh, you're doing sort of a disservice to people by not investing the time uh, into the games or? Um, Definitely, yeah. Um, also, too, like because usually we're reviewing on tight deadlines, and so like I've got to finish a game in like a weekend. Your average gamer is not going to spend sixty bucks to play a game and be done completely with it in two days. So that's another pro that's another reason I've you know been less interested in doing reviews because it's you're not representing you know the normative audience experience. Like there are like. I would say the average gamer is still playing stuff that they spent good money on six months a year ago, and the nature of our job makes it like inappropriate. Like it's too late for me to like publish a front page article on Mass Effect 2, and it's not that old. You know what I mean? It's too late to talk. About Modern Warfare is so last year. You know what I mean? So I definitely, I'm lucky in that um, I don't really you know rely on reviewing for my career, and I've you know I'm able to. I pretty much only have to write about the games that I'm interested in and I can these days and I can take as much time with them as I want and that's that's the way that I like to work because I think you're absolutely right. Can, can we test this though? Another show of hands. I, I guess I'm getting good at this. So raise your hand if you bought God of War 3 and keep it up if you still haven't finished it. So more, most of you already burned through it, right? So you guys played it in like the first weekend you got it? 
So yeah, how come you did that? Are you like afraid of being left behind because we're telling you what the base is? You, know? <laughs> you, can't, you, can't, you can't stop playing God of War three. Uh, right? I, well, start, I, I suck at going. it. I'm not any good at it. I gotta play on easy but mode. To answer your question, I mean, I haven't written about Team Fortress two uh, since it came out, other than for the stuff that Valve spoon feeds us in terms of like funny new trailers and re you know revelations of weapons and things like that. And that's kind of the you know the, the shallower side of the you know, games journalism is just kind of regurgitating what's in the promotional cycle. There's a lot of people who are interested in it. It's, you, know, you could certainly argue safely that there's a news value to talking about what's happening in TF2 and what the new options are going to be. But if games are tra travel journalism, I haven't been to the country of Team Fortress 2 in many years. Uh, I've, in, in essence, treated it as if nothing has happened, that there's no life happening there, that it's just this desolate place, when in fact there's people kind of living in it to carry yeah. the metaphor on. And it's, it's negligent of games journalists, myself included, to not have found ways to revisit these places and to know I what's going on in the community of those. I do, well, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I do notice that games that have made a particular, like I still will mention Silent Hill, you know, even though they're like, you know, they're not really even making traditional Silent Hills anymore. Games that make a huge impact on my lexicon, I continue to reference and they inform the way that I write about other games. Um, but that's really, you know, yeah. the only way that yeah, I mean, I think the issue, it's a, it's a partly a writing issue, too. Like, the travel journalism analogy is good in the sense that, like, you should want to read about places that you haven't been to, right? And so, as writers, we should be seeking to write things that would be applicable. Like, oh, you've never played this game, but here, let me explain either what's interesting to me or what's interesting about the developers who made it in a way that's palpable for people who haven't played. I mean, that should be an end game. At least that's what we're trying to do. But you could go from being a travel journalist to being a foreign correspondent, and we don't have many of those hmm. in video games, and that would be interesting if somebody just reporting on the interesting stuff going on in the world Especially of Especially given there's so many yeah. online games that are like real worlds that are persistent and ongoing and very yeah, important it, to the people. Especially in the case them. of Team Fortress 2, um, which, is a, which has a, a community of high-level competitive play, I mean, does that need something that's more like sports writing? Right, where you're you're covering a, an ongoing community of, of high-level competition, it, not, not yeah. a product. It could, uh, or it could all. be, or it could be similar to what I was saying about the real sports show, and that they then find right. people who play baseball. But the story isn't really about people who play baseball. It's about, you know, uh, the one of the great stories that I saw on, on the on the most recent episode is about a guy who was blind since the age of three and became a world record holder in um, skiing, blind skiing, which I didn't even know uh, was something that people could compete in. And he was going down slopes at 65 miles an hour. He set a speed record. And the story was actually about how a few years ago his sight was restored through a surgical procedure and how that and, and now he actually is he has a ski as well <laughs> now that he can see and wow. it's a story that ostensibly was about skiing and about sports but it was really much more about that they even had i, I recommend you you watch this because it was really a, a great wow. segment they have they filmed him live when he went to the doctor and they took the bandage off and he could see for the first time in 40 something years and could see his wife for the first time ever it's pretty wow. amazing um the gentleman in the beard <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Stephen, you, you mentioned earlier how things, have, same things, are always changing so fast in the, in the yeah. community and that sort of thing. But I, I, I'm sure you'd agree that things are changing very, very fast in your profession as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I was wondering if each of, like, all of you guys have fairly, um, you know, your sort of top of your uh, careers. Um, Going it's all but downhill. So, so <laughs> you project, uh, I'd actually what do you like guys to think announce your my resignation. What are going to be like in five or ten years? I mean, like they're so different, right, from where they were five years ago. Like, what do you guys think <coughs> to be a games journalist? What do you think that's going to mean in five, ten years? I'll, I'll be a community manager. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never be a community manager. Don't worry. Uh, or cheer for it or whatever. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say because five years ago I was just beginning at MTV and I didn't even have a blog yet and wasn't allowed to use the first person when I wrote and things, things have changed. They didn't allow me to be on TV and then that changed as well and they actually were willing to point a camera at me instead of over my shoulder at somebody else. Uh, so things do, things do change but it, it's increasingly hard for uh, journalists to make mon money for the work that they do. Um, but there are bright entertaining, uh, enterprising outlets uh, and companies, dare I mention Gawker Media, the, you know, which is having a lot of success with what, what Kotaku, Gizmodo, and our you know, other sister blogs do uh, just a few blocks from here. But it is, it is certainly hard. I hope that five years from now I'm able to do sort of similar to what I'm doing, but who knows. I'm hoping to become Bobby Kodak's administrative assistant. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I have no idea. 
I mean, I certainly can think of things that I would like to do. Like I, you know, there's a lot of publications that I'd still like to write for. There's a lot of kinds of articles that I still hope to do. Like I, I can only think of it in terms of like what I want to accomplish and what I think I still have got left. Um, you know, like. I really want there to one day be like a TV show where people just sit and talk about games the way that you know we do. You know, like there's all kinds of different ways. I think that you know, Lachlan Group for <laughs> 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 like Meet the Press. Um, yeah, no, there's like all kinds of things that could still happen, but it's hugely contingent on the changing shape of games. Um, you know, I have no idea what they're like. Again, you're right. Five years ago, we couldn't have predicted anything that's going on right now about games or about our work. So God, it, like pr asking me to project 10, 15 years out, I. I'm excited about the future, but I have no idea like what it'll be. I've staked my claim. I mean, I feel like what I'm doing is significant. I think there's going to be an increased interest in long, longer format criticism, journalism. I mean, I think you kind of see there's like the great work that you guys are doing. I think that, I don't know, it's like documentary and news, right? You know, yeah. CNN, the CNN that covers every, or well, man, it's a bad example, BBC or whoever you guys get your news from. They cover everything that's happening on, from the ground up, but then you have HBO documentary that comes back to whatever it is, the Iranian Revolution a year later and says like, here is, you know about this, but here let's tell you some other story that we have time and hopefully resources to develop. So that, that's, that, that's my interest and that's the direction that I'm moving in. Um, and I would like to think that that's where the future's headed. Yeah, right. if, I, if I didn't think there wasn't gonna be increasing um, acceptance of and desire for the kind of work that's important to us three, I wouldn't still be doing this. So I hope that's what's gonna happen. Yeah. Um, so let's just do a couple more, maybe the gentleman on the very end there. Yes. Hey, um, so I've, um, I've worked a couple of jobs where I've done music uh, I'm sorry, um, game previews and um, and game news respectively, but not really game criticism, criticism. but I did spend a few years doing music criticism for a living. And um, one of the things, like one of the, one of the perceptions, like one of the things that you hear is like, oh, music critics, music reviewers are frustrated musicians. <laughs> and um, you generally hear that from bands that get bad reviews. But I was wondering if there was any sort of similar perception or sentiment between games media and people who actually make games, any kind of similar? There's, I definitely think there's a huge conception on the, de on the part of developers that we all are just kind of like armchair designers and we wish we could do what they're doing and we can't. Um, and that's sort of borne out by the fact that a lot of games writers either lose their jobs and get, you know, you know, or get sick of being broke and decide to become, as Stephen joked, community managers or something. You know, so the fact that many of us have crossed over sort of lends fuel to that fire. Um, I don't think it's true. Um, I would, ha I w you couldn't, there's no amount of money you could offer me to do games development. Oh my God, oh my God. I, they, they have my, my <laughs> compassion and my sympathy every day. It's, it's, it does not seem like a fun thing to do, nor would I be any good at it. So, I mean, for my part, no. I, I suppose in the abstract, right? I mean, not in a practical sense. I suppose, like, you know, when I used to write about music, like, yeah, it would be awesome if I was in Radiohead. Yeah, that would be <laughs> <laughs> So I guess that sort of exists latently. I mean, the more pragmatic side of me is like, you know, I'm not particularly, I'm, I like writing, and I know they can't do what I do, and I can't do what they do. And yeah, I'm definitely here to be a writer. Yeah. I mean, there was kind of a big uh, uh, diaspora a little while ago. We had Luke Smith and Sean Elliott and Jeff Green. And, even Eric Wolpaw, kind of, who ended up at Valve, was a, sort of made that same uh, jump. Well, I don't know. I don't know anyone who at Valve was like, "Do you want to come write for us?" Would yeah. definitely say no. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. even I would be like, "Oh, uh, about yeah. that thing I said about." Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do we have time for uh, for one more? Maybe the gentleman in the tie. Um, as we were speaking of game reviews and things like that before, I was actually wondering what your opinion was on whether or not the gaming audience actually benefits from having all these different types of reviews, like score-based, not score-based, even stuff that like Area 5 and Co-op does with just talking about games on their show. Do you think it actually benefits from all those different kinds, or there should just be like one solid formula for what a review should be? Oh, the more information, the better. The more methods, the oh, more interesting it is. I don't like numbers, but aside from that, I mean, they're helpful, I think. I just, I think they're helpful if people go and read the reviews, but I think often what happens is people just look at the Metacritic score. And I think it's bad for reviewers. So if you just look at the number, that's bad. But numbers in and of themselves are not the end all. I mean, it's not yeah. the worst I, thing. Yeah, I think our review system at Kotaku is better than anybody else's. So. Me too, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. We don't Except you're always like wrong, like about New Heroes we don't too. Put scores <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't put scores on them because we think people can read and, and that you know, we, we color code. The, what we like is in blue, but we don't like is in red. It should, <laughs> that kind of helps. People then start counting how many blue words versus red words. But it's, 
<laughs> tells you what the game Everyone is. Everyone needs some kind of like people. Also, it, this comes back to the gaming audience and how I think they. To a lot of gamers, reading about and write the reception of games and the culture around games is a sport to them. That's why people get so up in arms about console wars and, you know, like, everyone really can't wait to see, like, for example, God, like, oh my God, like, Edge gave this game. You know, like, people, are, people care about that because it's like validating their opinion with scores just the, way, the same way that they would at a sports game. You know, I don't know if people benefit from that, but a lot of people certainly enjoy it and would be very mad if we took it away from them, <laughs> you know? Um, well, I think maybe we're going to wrap it up there. Um, or maybe one, one last question. You look so sad. One last question. Aww. And then we're going to wrap it up. Last question. Go ahead. Um, my question is, if the, we have next-gen games, 360, PS3, so why aren't the reviews um, like more updated? You can't really say that the same criteria that you based a PS2 game on or a PS1 game on or a regular Xbox game from regular graphics or from whatever you based it on, you can't base that on a 360 game or a PS3 game because the 360 game and the PS3 game, of course, is going to have great graphics and you know, uh, things like that. So is there a through line or is this a whole new universe that requires a whole new set of criteria? I, th I, th I mean, is, it uh, the criteria is, is, is it good, right? Is it ultimately, is it the criteria for the review? Um, but I just downloaded Microsoft's Game Room on the Xbox 360, which is this virtual arcade, and I was reminded that I think most old games suck. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I hate, I hate old games. No, I, Burger time, dude. Burger I re can't stand it. And I'm sure that I enjoyed some of those games back then, and I'm sure I thought some of them looked awesome. And Donkey Kong holds up, Tetris holds up, but I think like history cannot be denied that a lot of those games are garbage, but at the time they w were probably reviewed very positively. So that is a challenge. Maybe if more, maybe That's you could why have like No More Heroes too. Me, me, <laughs> no, no, I like the first better. But, but I thought where you were going with that is if, if there's next gen game systems, should there be next gen reviews? Should there be some new feature <laughs> yes. reviews? And when are those coming? And, and, and can, so I mean, maybe the same Speaking way you can have. Not, a, we're announcing something at E3. Like, the secret well, like, at the bottom of the. With uh, a PS3, you can update the firmware. It takes like 10 minutes for the firmware to update, but you can do it. So maybe once in a while we have we will patch our reviews or something. Yeah. Yes. How about that, right? Please. We'll, we'll put out DLC for the review, some oh. additional content. <laughs> if you want to know, you have to pay for it, though. Two dollars, and I'll if you pay me two dollars. I'll tell you a little more of what I thought about. Yeah. The game. yeah. Well, you can buy the review, but then if you actually want to know the stars, it's going to be incremental, yeah. like two fifty. Right. Right. I love it. I'm going to yeah. microtransact. So, Future journalism. Yeah. Right here. yeah. yeah. But, We're but, keeping up with the times. But but seriously, I mean, to your point, uh, uh, that is something that I haven't really thought much about. But it's interesting. Is this should we be finding a way to uh, reflect kind of the passage of time uh, with our reviews. I don't know if it would make sense to go back and change the reviews or something like that. But that's a, a good question. I'm not sure what the answer is. All right. So the, the future of games journalism. You, you heard it here first. Yeah. We're working um, on it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to our panelists. And uh, thank you all for coming. Take a picture. Take a picture, everybody.